Charles Wolfenson, you are from Remeso at Linköping University. Um, I know it's in your the title of Remeso that you're a center of excellence, but I, I think it also very much is so. Uh, the one center of study on migration in, in, in Sweden has very uh, important scholars and results, and also is very much involved in, uh, in my impression in, in, in the day-to-day -day business of migration, and you're trying to reach out with your results and uh, make an input into current discussions and policy debates, which I think is, is very good. I'm very happy that you can make it and the floor is yours, Charles. Thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, thank you to Global Utmaning for the <coughs> invitation to come uh, here today. I'm very pleased uh, to have been invited, particularly on this topic, because um, I myself as uh, some of you know, uh, lived in the Baltic states for 10 years uh, from uh, uh, 1999 onwards. And uh, in 2010, I joined the great westward migration of the Balts and uh, came to Sweden uh, to Linköping University, which is my new home. Um, I think the first thing to say is the question mark in the title is very important after the crisis because of course it's not over yet people and uh, we really don't know how it's going to pan out. But what I, I want to do today is to take up what Lisa suggested is perhaps the most productive way forward in terms of trying to get a handle on what's happening which is to look at the regional complex that the Scandinavian and Baltic countries form and to see uh, if there is a developing migration nexus and what that means for both the sending countries of the Baltic states and for the receiving countries in Scandinavia and the Nordic region. Now I've only got half an hour so I'm not going to be able to, to, um, to uh, to deal with all of the issues, but I hope that in the discussion, if, if I've missed things, we can perhaps pick them up there. Let me start with a, a word to my two key sponsors, one of whom Lisa mentioned, the Swedish Institute, which has a VISBY program specifically devoted to the Baltic states, and I fortunately received some money from them to study many of the issues we're going to talk about today. In addition, the uh, Swedish Council for Working Life and Social Research, FAS, have also generously given me a, a, a large sum of money to look at the uh, question of the future of the Swedish model in relation to migration. And finally, just a word of thanks to uh, uh, Indra Gendaliti, whom some of you, you met yesterday at the workshop, who is a doctoral student in uh, Remeso and uh, uh, worked night and day to help get this uh, presentation together. So thanks to all those people. So, where we are today? Well, here's the GDP in purchasing power standard. There's a lot of different measures of GDP, but what I want you to take from this chart is that Estonia, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia, in terms of gross <coughs> domestic product, are down towards, shall we say, the bottom end of the EU 27. In general, well below European Union 27 averages. If we put that in hard figures, uh, gross domestic product per inhabitant <coughs> for each of the Baltic states, you can see the figures there. Estonia, about 12,000 euros. Latvia, 9, 10. Lithuania, just over 10,000 euros, and the average monthly wages, and they are, well, comparatively quite low. I draw your attention to this slide because the Baltic states and Sweden and Scandinavia are really two different worlds. And I think sometimes my colleagues here in, in uh, Sweden in particular don't appreciate just how different uh, 
It is in Scandinavia with its developed welfare system, social protection, uh, participatory democracy, all the good things that they like to celebrate in the Nordic Scandinavian model, uh, and a rather contrastive situation in the Baltic states, which uh, since independence in the early 90s have pursued what one might say is a path of development based upon open market principles, well, neoliberal ideology, a very different kind of social and economic configuration to that which exists in the Scandinavian and Nordic region. And in a sense, this map here with the attendant figures highlights the rather different emphases in uh, the Nordic region, Scandinavia, to the Baltic states. And I think that that difference between, shall we say, welfareist social democracy and a rather different kind of neoliberal open market system is something that underlies everything that I'm going to try and talk about this morning. In the first instance, the way we were. Well, when I was in the Baltic States in the mid-2000s, I was part of this incredible boom that followed European Union enlargement, with GDP growth rates in Latvia that were equivalent to, at that time, China. Absolutely extraordinary, and Estonia and Lithuania not that far behind and uh, well above the EU 25, as it was then, averages. And indeed, the description that was used was that of the Baltic Tigers. And of course, the Irish had the Celtic Tiger. Uh, and uh, that translated into some very interesting statistics. In terms of house prices, uh, euros per square meter in Lithuania actually exceeded those in Stockholm in the mid-2000s. So we had an incredible property-fueled bubble of optimism and consumption in the Baltic <coughs> states, in which all limits were off. And the banks, in particular the Swedish banks, which regard and still do, the Baltic states as a kind of neo-colony, <laughs> part of the Swedish Empire, I think. Uh, they financed this bubble. And I can remember being in Lithuania at the time when I was a, 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 a customer of one of the banks, I won't name which one, and receiving text messages on my cell phone saying, come into the bank and borrow more money from us. That's the way it was, and unfortunately for the Swedish <coughs> banks, it meant a massive exposure in terms of liabilities when uh, household indebtedness, which skyrocketed, as you can see here from the mid-2000s, began to run into difficulties. I put Sweden in there as well because, you know, uh, uh, we haven't crashed yet here in Sweden. But <laughs> I think anybody looking at that needs to think about where Sweden is heading as well. Uh, anyway, a very famous economist once said, a trend that cannot continue will not. Very wise. And as I traveled around the three Baltic states, and that was my mission to teach in all of the Baltic universities, or all the major universities that I could at that time, I said to the student, you know, this bubble cannot continue. Read the smart press, the Financial Times, The Economist. And this, by the way, is from 2007. <coughs> Crash didn't come until at least a year later in the Baltic State. And they're saying, the headlines are there. Hard landing is coming. Everybody said to me, no, it's not going to be a hard landing, it's going to be a soft landing. Chaz, you need to go out more, relax, take in a couple of beers, it's not going to be like that. 
That was the uh, response that I got in the Baltic states when I said, listen, people, this can't go on. And of course, it didn't go on. And from the middle of 2008, uh, the crash really accelerated to the point at which within the space of roughly 12 months, GDP had slumped in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia under the impact of the bursting of the property bubble that we looked at a couple of moments ago, and of course, the global financial and economic crisis. The two things coming together produced the most severe downturn in the global economy as a whole occurring in the Baltic states just across the water from where we are today. Approximately 18% uh, loss of GDP in Latvia, somewhat less but not much in Estonia and Lithuania. Staggering figures. Now we can see in the graph that there's the beginnings of a recovery from 2010 onwards and no doubt people want to talk about that recovery because it, it is uh, significant but uh, people you need to see where we've started from and the question is and this is the really important question how sustainable will that recovery be <clears throat> let me just uh, stay with the crisis for the moment because these kind of hard figures show the scale to which GDP uh, declined in comparison to the previous year in 2009, comparing one quarter with the same quarter in 2008. As I said, about 18% for Latvia, slightly less for Lithuania and Estonia. And what that meant in real terms was uh, businesses simply shut down overnight. Uh, and the level of unemployment skyrocketed after a period during the mid-2000s when unemployment was declining quite significantly, particularly with uh, European Union accession, down to a low point of about 4% in uh, <coughs> Lithuania in uh, 2007. But by 2009-2010, we have Latvia up at a gross unemployment of 18% with Estonia, Lithuania. Again, not far behind. And we can see the beginnings of a downturn improvement, should I say, in the most recent period. But a staggering fall in employment <coughs> and a staggering fall in real wages, which again you can see from uh, this graph here after a period from uh, European Union accession in May 2004 until about 2007, uh, 2008, of really remarkable pay rises, some 20% in that year. I mean, it, it was, uh, it was, this fat years, yeah, it was the good times. But by 2009, uh, the, the picture was radically different and those of you from the Baltic states uh, who work in the public sector will know the scale of wage cuts that you suffered but by 2009 uh, the, the picture was radically different and those of you from the Baltic states uh, who work in the public sector will know the scale of wage cuts that you suffered private sector slightly less, but still uh, <coughs> significant wage cuts uh, and a significant decline in household consumption and living standards. Again, comparing as we did before, 2009 quarterly uh, outputs with those of 2008, you can see that the scale of um, cutbacks in I mean, people were actually not buying basics in order to try and save money. Uh, and that, those, uh, those figures speak eloquently to the level of cutbacks and the uh, increasing poverty 
that was uh, widespread in the Baltic states uh, during these years. And uh, the spike for Latvia, of course, is, is quite uh, extraordinary. Uh, but also in Lithuania, a sharp increase in poverty. In Estonia, apologies if there's anyone here from Estonia. I don't know what they do with the data in Estonia, but it always looks better than the other two Baltic states. <laughs> I'm always deeply suspicious of it. Say nothing about that. Just to take you to the end of the, 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 the curve, we, we can see more or less a convergence with uh, EU uh, with uh, EU 27. You know, in terms of of poverty after social transfers, but radical differences during the period of the crisis in terms of the scale and depth <coughs> of poverty. Uh, and uh, perhaps this shows it a little bit better. Here's the contemporary figures with Latvia and Lithuania down at the bottom, as I said, Estonia somehow managing to creep in um, slightly better than EU 27 averages. And there's Poland there too. So the bottom part of the, the chart is where the Baltic states and Poland uh, currently lie with respect to poverty among young people. This, I think, makes the point more strongly. At risk of poverty and social exclusion, these are the latest figures we could get from Latvia, uh, it's about 38% of the population at risk of poverty and social exclusion. That's, you can correct me here if I've got this wrong, it's 37, 38%. <coughs> Lithuania, around about 32, 33%. <coughs> Estonia, 20, 21%. But for Lithuania uh, and Latvia, well above the EU 27 averages, Poland also Estonia, apparently not the case. But these figures, I mean, are the only countries doing worse, if you want to put it like that, are Bulgaria and Romania. And uh, these kind of translating into hard, hard euros, we have a fifth of the population in Lithuania on less than 240 euros a month, 6% on about 19 euros a month. So let's talk about migration. That's why we're here. That was the crisis, and the crisis has had an important migration effect. But before I come to that, let's talk about European Union accession. Because for the first time, Sweden, Ireland, and the UK opened their borders to the free movement of persons, and uh, we saw significant numbers of people leaving Latvia, Lithuania, and in particular Poland for the older member states. Those are the gross numbers for 2004-2007, but interestingly, when you look at the percentage of the working age population that left, Lithuania lost more of its working population than Poland, uh, Latvia lost more than Poland, uh, Estonia, with a circular migration to Finland, has got a slightly overall lower out-migration rate. That was the period then of EU accession, and interestingly, Latvia and Lithuania have lost the most significant proportions of their working age population. More recently, we have seen a dramatic spike in Lithuanian out-migration. This is migration uh, per thousand inhabitants. <coughs> uh, also from Latvia, uh, and to a lesser extent, much lesser extent from Estonia. Now, there's a debate going on about whether the Lithuanian spike if we can call it that, is a real representation of the numbers going. Because of a change in the law in Lithuania, 
which provided a powerful incentive for people to declare their official departure from the country and thereby avoid liability for insurance, uh, state insurance contributions. So many people who may not have declared in the past may have declared in the period 2009-2010. But nevertheless, this represents whether it should be a sharp peak or a more rounded peak. This represents the scale of Lithuanian outward migration. And we can talk the hard numbers uh, as we go through here. <coughs> so the crisis has produced an exit on an unparalleled scale, and indeed in Lithuania it is described as an evacuation of Lithuania. And those of you who are from there know that. The cohorts who are leaving in the largest numbers are those in the 20 to 29 age group. And the implications of that for economic and social sustainability are obvious. This is the cohort that you can least afford to lose. But I mean significant numbers of uh, very young people are also leaving. And that would suggest that what we're seeing now is a new phenomenon not the migration of the single worker for a period of time from the new member states to the old member states to earn income and then return, but for the first time I think we're seeing significant family outward migration. And that speaks to a rather deeper shift in people's perceptions of what their society might have to offer them in terms of future life chances, prospects for themselves and for their children. And this again speaks volumes to the issue of sustainability. Emigration by gender, you can see that, uh, as I said a moment ago, it is no longer simply the uh, unskilled or semi-skilled or even skilled single manual worker migrating for a limited period. It is both male and female, more or less equally balanced in Lithuania at the moment. Latvia has slight excess females and similarly for Estonia. Well, you know, there is a debate about migration and its costs to the sending society and its benefits to the sending society. And one of the biggest benefits that migration uh, scholars like to talk about is remittances. The money that people earn abroad and then send back to the uh, source country. Well, uh, these remittances have been significant and substantial. For uh, Lithuania, you can, uh, sorry, for Latvia in the first instance, uh, you can see that they have been high uh, through the mid 2000s. They plateaued during the crisis and they are now declining. I've had uh, some conversations on this and uh, you may have your own view as to why that should be and we could talk about it later on. In Lithuania, we have a more or less progressive upward trend, which means that approximately today about 1.5 billion euros are remitted to Lithuania from those who have gone abroad. And uh, uh, so it's about um, a billion to Latvia, and it's about uh, 600 uh, million to Estonia. It has a significant economic impact, although 
the picture is mixed. But what one can say is, if you like, a headline for 2010, about 9% of Latvian household consumption is financed by remittances coming from abroad. Uh, slightly less than that in Lithuania, and about 6-7% in Estonia. So it's significant. And I guess one way of looking at it is a plus of a kind. As a proportion of GDP for Lithuania, it is absolutely a significant element, nearly 5%, 4.6%, less for Latvia, 25 and for Estonia, 1.8%, Poland, 1.5%. So if you compare Poland, Estonia, even Poland, Estonia, and Latvia, Lithuania, you can see actually this is a bit of a divergence here. So more people left Lithuania proportionately and more remittances are flowing back to Lithuania. And GDP contracted more. Yes indeed and GDP well no the sharpest contraction of GDP was Latvia not Lithuania. Uh, and that you've kind of touched on something that I'm thinking a lot about and talking with Indre and we're working. Is there something special about Lithuania and its migration? Has it got a different character to that of Latvia and Estonia? Well, people here might have views on that as well, but I, we have some views as well, which I'll put you in a couple of minutes. Let's talk demographics and population loss, because Lisa mentioned that in her remarks, and we have some interesting data for you. First of all, life expectancy. Well, male life expectancy in uh, Lithuania is, I think, the lowest or the second lowest in the European Union. Latvia <coughs> close beside it. Uh, Estonia doing slightly better. Let's compare Lithuania, 68 years with Sweden at 79.6. That's a huge difference. It's over 10 years life expectancy for males. Now, I, um, at other times, I won't inflict this on you today, dug deep into the mortality statistics and the causes of this, but um, it's deeply, deeply worrying. And when you chart expectations of healthy life years at the age of 50 against life expectancy at 50, what you find is that the three Baltic states and Hungary yeah, are in the wrong corner, if I can put it to you like that. This is not where you want to be. You want to be <coughs> right up there with Denmark and the Scandinavian countries. Sweden's up there and so on. So, low life expectancy and negative population growth from 1993 onwards. We can see this, and uh, I, I, I stole this from my, my colleague uh, in Latvia, Peter S. Uh, very important work. He's a great demographer. And what the minuses uh, are clear. Uh, the birth rate is not allowing a natural replacement of the population because the death rates are higher and significantly higher than the birth rates. That's <coughs> the two Baltic states aggregated. And uh, this very beautiful chart, which uh, we pinched from. Uh, set bank <laughs> did something decent um, shows the uh, uh, aggregate natural decrease in population from 1992-93 onwards only Estonia right up there at the second last bar, the third last bar managed to pop over into positive uh, positive population growth uh, but it's back down again in 
Um, so you can say that's a uniform picture with uh, uh, Latvia on the whole performing even worse than Lithuania and Estonia. And in fact, I think the natural uh, fertility rate in Latvia today is the lowest in the European Union. Here's another way of looking at it, comparing 2000 with 2011, or 2011 with 2000, and the shaded areas here represent the decline of the population in those age groups over a space of 10 years. So we can see the shrinkage of <coughs> those from 20 on, but it goes right the way up, but the most, the most radical uh, shrinkage of population is in the 20 to 29 cohorts. This is a very, very sobering diagram. And the population projections are not good. The most rapidly aging populations in Europe <coughs> are in the Baltic states. The most rapidly declining populations in Europe are in the Baltic states. And this, uh, of course, it's, um, it's a projection, but uh, this shows very clearly that uh, for Lithuania, the population, according to uh, the census data, which uh, I think is the one thing we need to go with, is just about 3 million today. And by the middle of this century, will be around 2.5 million. Now remember, at independence, the Lithuanian population was something like 3.7 million. Is that correct? Five? Six. Okay. 3.6 million. So this gives you the scale of the population loss in Lithuania from uh, 2010 to 2060. But there's already been, and this is my point, a prior loss of some five, six hundred thousand people before we get even to this point. And I could replicate the same figures for Latvia, I don't have the latest figures uh, of the Estonian census. If there's anybody here from Estonia, they can help me out there. But also for Latvia, 200, uh, 2, million, 2 million, with a projection down to 1.5 million of a population by the middle of this century. Again, the question is, is this sustainable? What human resources have you got left here? How are you going to support the aging population? Who is actually going to do anything in terms of productive employment when you don't have the people? You've exported them, or you failed to replace them. And now, if you eh, forgive me for the last couple of minutes that I have, I, I'll kind of put my sociological hat on uh, because this is the stuff that actually interests me the most. I did raise the question, maybe there's something different about the Lithuanian out-migration. I don't want to debate that endlessly. But I do want to say this, that having chosen the neoliberal path of development, the elites of the Baltic states at the same time chose an exclusionary, a very harsh form of social development, a highly competitive society in which issues of, shall we say, voice for ordinary people, representation, and issues of equity and social justice were far down the scale of priorities for the new elites for whom economic development, if you like, at all costs, was the priority. Now I have to say that, and it's critical, but it's true. And that also relates to the issue of what people think they've got 
by way of a stake in their own society. Because I said it's an exclusionary form of development. It's a form of development that rewards the rich. It rewards the successful. And it stigmatizes and excludes those who are not powerful and who are not successful. Now there are two narratives here. And this takes us to the heart of the matter. The neoliberal narrative, which is being promoted currently by the private, former Prime Minister Dombrovskis of Latvia with Anders Oslund from the Peterson Institute in Washington, says that yes, okay, we imposed harsh measures of austerity on our populations, but it has been successful and we must continue <coughs> on the previous path of neoliberal policies in the economy and society. And they have toured the globe with this manifesto, how Latvia came through the financial crisis. And Christine Lagrande, or is it Lagarde, I can never remember. Lagarde of the IMF says, let us follow the Latvian way. Those, um, what's the word, those uh, spendthrift Eurozone countries like Greece uh, need to learn the lessons of radical internal devaluation, of radical austerity that the Latvians successfully implemented. And right here in Stockholm, the um, Lithuanian Prime Minister got red carpet treatment at the Stockholm School of Economics as he explained how Lithuania came through the economic crisis using internal devaluation, radical cuts in living standards. And from the Washington Post and the New York Times, the message is clear. It's almost overpowering. There are a few dissenting voices in my colleagues Michael Hudson and Jeffrey Summers in Counterpunch and other, um, and other uh, outlets and uh, we managed to get a few in the Financial Times and the Guardian, have been saying, well, no, actually the price of pursuing radical austerity measures as a way out of the crisis has been too high. And it's important that we talk about this. Well, of course, it hasn't all been love and peace in the Baltic states. That was Riga when the government introduced the radical raft of cuts in pensions, in wages, <coughs> changes to uh, employment <coughs> legislation. Similarly, in Lithuania, and I don't know if my colleague here from the Lithuanian Labour Federation was there on that great day when they tried to storm the parliament, uh, <laughs> led by the short troops here. <laughs> uh, this to me is <coughs> emblematic. Here is free democratic, independent, post-communist Lithuania in 2009. And this is the lesson of austerity. Mm -hmm. Ask the population what they think about the shift from state-controlled planned economy to the free market. Well, in 1991, three quarters of, of Lithuanians said, yes, let's have more of this market stuff. It's good for us. We like it a lot. By 2009, that was only 50% of the population, a 26% decline. Here again, was it better or was it worse under communism? Well, actually, nearly half the population are saying, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, worse today than it was under communism. <coughs> good for <coughs> Here's what the Estonian uh, have collected in, from the Human Development Report. Uh, it shows that, well, Sweden's quite happy. We think things are going well here. Estonians have been happier, but they're not desperately unhappy in Estonia. But in Lithuania and Latvia, a profound social pessimism 
and it's captured here by the uh, president of uh, Lithuania in her State of the Nation address, and it's the only long quote I'm putting up here today, but I think it's important because this, this is a really insightful summary, and it's, I, I just want to kind of leave you as I conclude today with, with what she's saying. It's not just about <coughs> economics. It's about how people see themselves in relation to the state, and she could have said in relation to society. She said, look, we're comforting ourselves by saying that all these people are leaving, and you'll remember the huge spike for, as a natural consequence of the downturn. But they're going to countries like the UK and like Ireland that are themselves in the grip of crisis. How do we explain this? So the invitation is to look reality in the face and admit that people are emigrating not just for economic reasons, but because they feel, in her words, alien at home. This is a deeper understanding of migration. Well, my last, second last slide. What are the threats facing the Baltic countries? Demographic decline? No question. How are we going to support our populations? Our, what welfare systems threadbare though they are, exist. How are you going to deal with the question of skill shortages, skill mismatches for the medium and long term? What are you going to do when people don't earn enough to finance public welfare systems? Poverty and social exclusion are growing. And what do you do about this thing here that Dalia Glibuskaiti was referring to. Social disenfranchisement. A political alienation that is, if you like, underpinning this outward migration and accelerating it. Well, my last slide. After the crisis, I have to end on a semi-positive note, I think. Meeting the challenges of globalization because, of course, the crisis will pass. Eventually, all crises come to an end. Even died in the wool Marxists <coughs> that. Education is the first challenge that faces the Baltic states. And we need to take stock of what has happened to the education system during the years of crisis. The loss of teachers, the introduction of fees, the cutbacks, the lack of school children in the schools. So that's an issue for the future. Labor. Well, you know, either you train your population, if you have a population, to do the job, or you import them from somewhere else because you don't have the people to do the jobs that need to be done. There is no question that non-Baltic labor will have to be recruited in the future. Now, that in itself will raise a huge complex of issues that relate to things like identity and citizenship, issues which have still not been satisfactorily resolved in the Baltic states. And I don't want to touch on sore points, but non-citizenship for significant minorities of your population, that's not smart these days. Migration policies. Well, those who have left, and Datsy can talk, I think, with authority on this, need somehow or other to be persuaded that there is a pathway back home and that there is a future for themselves and their families if they do come home. And finally, my last point, and I'm going to stop talking now, democratic and cohesion issues. Neoliberalism did not have as part of its agenda the promotion of social justice. I simply suggest to you that if you want to rebuild cohesion, if you want a strong democracy, then you have to find new channels of voice for ordinary people <coughs> in which they feel they have a stake in the political system, in the communities that they live, and that they have 
empowerment in the workplace. And that, I think, is my, my final point today. Thank you very much. And uh, the floor, I think, is so over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much, sir.